island of Bravo. This island is very important uh, with regard to Cape Verdean migration, particularly in New Bedford. Most Cape Verdeans who came to New Bedford came from the island of Bravo. Again, uh, very experienced whalers, but an added thing to what we saw going on in the Azores is that uh, all of the islands of Cape Verde were, were very poorly managed by the Portuguese. They were poorly managed and there were frequent droughts and famine. And so there were real push factors to get men to leave Cape Verde. In fact, when I was, and it still goes on to this day, so when I was there in December, my uncle made me call him every night to say goodnight, tell him what I had done on the islands and who I had visited and what I had seen. And he would end every conversation by saying, thank God my family came to the United States. So Cape Verdeans tend to love the islands, but they're very difficult. It's very difficult to survive on them. And so there was an impetus for whalers to get on these whaling ships and come to the US. What you see here, is something that's often described in whaling journals in every port. So uh, the typical scenario is the boats would be lowered from the large whaling ships, the whaling crew would row upon the shore, and then all of the locals would flood them with chickens and fruit and cloth to trade, and mostly what they seem to want is tobacco in exchange. And so Russell really depicts that uh, very clearly here. Yeah. So we're about to see another whaling scene. Again, it's going to be a little more graphic than the scenes we've seen thus far. You'll even see the process of cutting in. So before I took the job here at the museum, which was only last September, so I've only been here about a year, I was actually an anthropology professor, so I had almost no knowledge of, of whales and whaling. And one of the first things my son, who was 13 at the time, asked me was, how did they get those whales on the ship after they killed it? And I couldn't even answer him. Part of the answer is they kind of took it apart before they got it on the ship. So the process of cutting in, you get rid of the head, you get rid of the baleen, um, and then you can uh, cut, up, cut apart the whale for the oil. Now an odd thing about Yankee whalers as opposed to Japanese whalers is Yankee whalers did not want the whale meat. It just kind of went to waste. Um, Japanese whalers went whale hunting for the whale meat. Yankee whalers just wanted the oil. So our next port of call is Rio de Janeiro. This is an area where, based on some of the ships we're seeing, there was clearly an American and British naval presence, but for two very different reasons. So Americans were there, because of trade, right? So as American trade expanded across the Atlantic and through the Pacific, so did the Navy. The British were here because of the Aberdeen Act, which is something that might seem ridiculous to us now because it, it makes, it sort of diminishes the concept of sovereignty. So the Aberdeen Act was basically the British enforcing abolition of slavery with anyone they had business relationships with. And so although the British had no power in Rio, they sent ships there to suppress the slave trade. And they felt that it was okay for them to do because they traded there. As we move into the city, you'll see architecture that is very clearly Portuguese in origin. And like New Bedford, again, we're seeing a very, very busy port town and harbor. There are a couple of noteworthy scenes in this imagery. So right here, we see three men are probably enslaved because another thing you see time and time again in whaling journals and in naval records 
is really the only people you ever see carrying loads in Brazil are slaves. And so the fact that they're carrying those sacks means that they're probably a slave. This here, upon first glance, looks like just some men wearing hats. What they probably are, are also slaves carrying bags of sugar or coffee on their heads. Um, Charles Wilkes, who did an exploration of every sailing area in the world for the US government, um, has a great image of this in one of his books when he visited Rio. We have a big poster of it that we already passed, but there's an image of it here on this panel. And then, because Brazil was sort of different than we were here, we've got two people of African descent there that appear not to be enslaved, just out and join. Either sugar or coffee. Those were the two big crops in Brazil. Still are. Now I see this alternating in sections here. There are a lot of repairs here. Yeah. Wow. It's like all, all the yeah. way down till the end. I mean, all the way. Mm -hmm. So something really, really bad happened to the pizza. Yeah. And you can clearly distinguish the holder. Right, and the patches. Absolutely. So another really interesting scene is this one right here highlights the, the different way of sort of doing race in Brazil. Um, here we have indigenous Brazilian rowers, probably enslaved, and we've got a woman of European descent and a woman of African descent. If this was the southern United States, we definitely say that woman is her slave. We can't really say that in Brazil. The other thing about Brazil that this sort of imagery uh, represents is in Brazil, unlike in the US, where we have a system mostly of hypo-descent, so you've probably all heard of the one-drop rule. Because of slavery um, and some other systems that were going on at the same time, the general rule of thumb is, if a person has any African ancestry, that person is black. Period, end of discussion, right? Didn't happen in Portuguese and Spanish colonies in the same way. So in Brazil, the Portuguese set up a system of castas, uh, which was supposed to have a racial designation for every possible mixture and pure bloods, right? And so to this day in Brazil, one's race does not have anything to do with their ancestry or parentage. It's just what they look like, what their hair is like, what their nose shape is, what their skin color is, what their eyes look like. All of those features are used to designate one's race. At minimum, there are five. But there are places in Brazil where there are 400 different terms for 400 different supposed races. And so that's a product of this system where there was intermarriage and it was legal and you didn't have to default to the sort of uh, lowest social, the, whichever parents was, parent was lower on the social scale. That's not to say there isn't racism in Brazil, it's pretty rampant, um, but it's just a different way of doing and acknowledging race. Another thing about race in Brazil that's quite different uh, from other places, probably because slavery went on until 1888, so Brazil was the last place to abolish slavery. Uh, slaves were coming in until that date from Africa. So in Brazil, you see much, much more African culture than in other places where slavery was. And so, some of the religions, like Candomblé, which have, I think currently there are about 200 people that practice it, it's an African-based religion. Um, hair uh, sorry, hairstyles, food, language, a lot of that comes from African culture because it's not so far removed from the experience of Brazil. So after leaving Brazil, whale ships would round Cape Horn, and so that's what we're about to do. We're about to leave Brazil and go into the South Atlantic. So you just kind of have to hop over to roll through. system for hanging these so 
two people on the curatorial staff actually invented a kind of machine that we would put the panorama roll on it horizontally and it would roll it out so it ended up vertically. And so the way the installation happened oh, okay. is there were about three people dealing with that machine. So it was like up there and then coming off. Yeah. And then it would move down and pick up portions of it. Yeah, there. exactly. And so on the other side, right, when this roll was going up, that was happening. And then on the other side, there were two people with ladders. One would hold the section that was up there and hand it to the person next to them. And then I, that was my job. <laughs> then you get down the ladder, you move your ladder around, you climb up, and then you grab the section from the person you just handed it to. It was quite efficient, but it just took a long time. And it was before they had AC in here, so it was so miserable. <laughs> so now we're rounding Cape Horn, right? We've already been around Terra del, Terra del, Tierra del Fuego. And now we're at the Drake Passage. Again, lots of whales, lots of marine life, but a very dangerous place to sail. And Russell represents that a little further up ahead with a ship going down and the crew abandoning ship and hoping that another ship comes to rescue them. So this is around the same area of the world that that poem, The Rime of the Ancient Mariner, was written. Um, so that gives you a sense of what we're dealing with as far as weather and temperature. Um, so in The Rime of the Ancient Mariner, I'm sure you all know I had to read it in seventh grade. You probably did too. Uh, everything's going great. The winds are great. You know, it's nice and breezy. Uh, and then someone decides to shoot an albatross and then the winds stop, the sun becomes relentless, everyone's thirsty, uh, they're, they're almost, they're on the brink of death. And so they decide that they want to punish the person who gave them all this bad luck. And so they take the dead albatross and they tie it around his neck. And of course, that's where that saying comes from. Uh, you call someone an albatross around your neck. Russell actually represents some albatross up here, as well as some seals. So lots of good marine life here, just a really dangerous place to take your whale ships. But again, as there were fewer and fewer whales in the Atlantic, whalers took the risk. Because of course, they had to come home with their barrels full of oil so that the investors or the owners of the ship could get a return on their investment. And so we see a little more detail on the danger of whale hunting in this scene here. It happens quite frequently. This is called a stove boat. Often whales would just snap a boat in half. So really, really dangerous profession we're talking about. Many men did not make it home, which is also why captains were more than happy to take on crew wherever they could get them. Is this some sort of waterfowl? Yes. <laughs> I'm not sure of the, like the species. <laughs> so here's another area of the painting where, where Russell decides to have some fun and include some um, maritime lore, in this case, literature. So this island here is Juan Fernandez. This person here is supposed to represent Robinson Crusoe. So this is the island where that story took place. And so Russell is sort of paying tribute to that here, Robinson Crusoe and his goat. The other caves that we see here are not those of Robinson Crusoe, but representing a reality. So many of the islands off the coast of Chile uh, were penal colonies for the Spanish. And so they would send convicts over to do whatever they assign them to do, often infrastructural work. And so those are the caves where the convicts lived. Again, this stop is important because whalers would need to stop every so often, not only for rest, but for fresh water, fresh food, etc. The next island is also important in maritime folklore. Before I tell you why, um, I just want to point out that we're going to figure out how to deal with this issue with the painting, but I just want to point out that 
this painting is not at all to scale. So sometimes we go a couple hundred miles, sometimes we go several thousand miles. The distance in the actual painting has no relationship to the distance between two points. So we're thinking about putting a strip on the floor or something just to indicate you've gone 500 miles. So this island here is Pitcairn, and we know it because of the nose, which is this rock that seems very precarious in the Pitcairn Island is the island where all of the mutineers from the Mutiny on the Bounty settled. So some of the Irish crew, some Tahitian men, Tahitian women, and even one baby um, all took the bounty here, took it apart, used the wood to build their homes, and settled here. So that even 30 years later, when the whaler Bennett wrote in his journal that he visited Pitcairn, everyone on the island was a descendant of the mutiny. There's a banyan tree right in the center of the island. That might be an easier way to give a tour than up there. Yeah, really. That can reach everyone. We see sperm whaling off of Uapu, a part of the Marquesas. Next island we encounter is Nukuhiva, also of the Marquesas. Really important if you like Herman Melville, this is the island where he deserted ship and decided to stay for a length of time. His novel Taipei was based on the peoples and cultures of this particular island. Of great interest to me as an anthropologist is that this seems to be really the only place in the painting where Russell even gives you a hint of the degree of colonialism that was going on during this period. So not only in the Pacific uh, and Atlantic, but also the entire continent of Africa, all global superpowers were, were scurrying to divvy up the world. Um, and and Nukahiva, here we see lots of French soldiers uh, trying to enforce their rule. And the part that's rolled up here that you can't see, unfortunately, is Queen Pomer the Fourth trying to flee. And so when we were hanging this, one of the volunteers saw all of the little French soldiers. I guess they reminded her of toy soldiers around Christmas. And so she noted how cute this scene was. And I said, no, it's not cute at all. And I proceeded to explain the history uh, of the Marquesas here to her. This is not an accident, though I don't think Russell spent much time or put much effort into this particular part of the painting, but this is supposed to represent a petroglyph that's actually in the cliffs on Nukahiva uh, that represents a sailing vessel. And roll three is the longest roll of the panorama, so it actually goes down about a third of the way here. So now we're in the Society Islands. Uh, Tahiti is probably the most notable of the Society Islands. This is Joaquin. Um, again, unlike what we saw in the Marquesas, no hint of colonialism. Happy natives, happy sailors, everyone's happy, right? So people see people sailing, we see men carrying something that they hunted and caught, probably some sort of thing. We do see a mission here. And so missions started popping up around the same time as colonialism. So if you can imagine cultural hegemony is going on, political hegemony is going on, Christianity is a big part of that as well. The first missions in the Pacific were in 1820 in Hawaii. Sometimes sailors were happy about that, often they were not, especially when missionaries started fining sailors for drunkenness and fornication. That happened quite often in Hawaii, and there's a really famous story of a sailor, Henry Burns, who was jailed for public drunkenness and he died in jail. 
And so all the whalers in the town were very angry about it, and they decided to just burn down all of the stores, burn down the police station, and uh, I guess they sent their message about how they felt about missionaries. Missionaries often brag, particularly in Tahiti, about how they destroyed all of the native heathen idols um, and, and got the natives to be Christian. When you read native accounts or listen to native accounts, it's quite a different story. This here is supposed to represent the whale ship Essex. So again, not something contemporaneous with the, the painting, but something that Russell felt it was important to tell in his story. And so I'll go very quickly because I know most people know about the disaster on the Essex. The, the disaster on the whale ship Essex was the inspiration for the novel Moby Dick. A whale hit the ship, the ship went down, the crew had to get in their whale boats and row away. A smart thing for them to do would have been to go to the Marquesas or the Society Islands, which they were very close to. They decided not to do that for a very specific reason. They were afraid of Pacific cannibals. And so they decided, even though the wind was against them and it was very, very far away, that they would try to get back to Chile or Peru. Because of that decision, they were at sea for 95 days. Most of them died. And ironically, the ones who survived, survived because they resorted to cannibalism. So when two of them, there were a couple of different ships, uh, boats, sorry, that, that rode away. Um, one of the ships, sorry, one of the boats, when it was found, the two men on board were eating the fingers of a crewmate when they were found. So how serious was the risk of cannibalism if they thought they were left? There were cannibals in the Pacific. The risk probably wasn't that great. I mean, the risks to local people in the Pacific from whalers was far greater than the risks that Pacific people uh, posed to whalers. Usually cannibalism in the Pacific was the result of intertribal warfare, and so whalers really didn't have anything to fear. Plus they had lots of cool things to trade with, and so as long as they didn't make anyone angry, they didn't really have to worry about cannibalism. So was cannibalism more a cultural practice than a need for sustenance? Yes. Um, Consuming one's enemies. Yes, exactly. And uh, actually, while we're talking about how rare cannibalism is, I will tell you one sort of, one very true story of how uh, one crew was cannibalized. So in New Zealand, uh, there was a, a chief that was flogged for some reason. I don't think anyone knows, but a captain from a whaling ship flogged him. His men were so upset that they killed everyone on the island, ate them, put on their clothes, rowed out to the whale ship that they came in on, killed everyone that was on that ship, and burned the ship down. And then they felt like, okay, we're even, we can continue trading with whalers now. So it was, there was a possibility, but generally not if relations were friendly. This is Kaimikua Bay in Hawaii. Again, very idyllic picture. If you look behind you, I wasn't paying attention and I kept walking, but there's a really interesting scene by the hut back there where there are two girls that appear to be playing patty cake or something. One of them has no arms, one of them has no hands. Not sure if that was an oversight on, on the part of the artist or if again they were having fun. Here we see locals rowing out to whale ships, probably to trade. Just to bring up missionaries again, here we are on the island of Lahaina in Hawaii, which the Reverend Henry Cheever called one of the breathing holes of hell because it was so frequented by, by whalers and had body houses and there was lots of drunkenness and looting and rioting going on. Well, one of the things that's notable about Hawaii, you know, often when we talk about colonialism and culture change, we talk about it in the form of oppression, sort of these English norms were dictated and, and meant to be followed. In Hawaii, it was a little different. So Hawaii, unlike a lot of the other Pacific islands, was a pretty elaborate kingdom. When the kings saw the benefits of trade with the British and Americans, they decided to do away with all of their rules. 
So there are rules about sexuality and gender. They just said, hey, if these whalers want Native women, let them have Native women, right? And so it was really within that the culture in Hawaii started to change and not because of uh, cultural imperialism or anything like that. Here we see the most detailed, the most graphic, probably the best whaling scene in the painting. So we see a couple of stove boats again. Here we actually see men harpooning or lancing whales, all of the blood and gore. Then we see the process of cutting in. Here clearly the head has been cut from the whale because we see baleen. What you see on these ships here, ships are on fire. This is the process of trying out when the blubber is melted down. But I, was, I assume it would go into the night because the hunt went on all day. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Here's a really interesting scene. I remember it every time I do a tour, but I keep forgetting to ask if this is actually something that happened historically. Clearly, Locals have taken over a whaling ship and refused to let the crew back on. So here you see whalers trying to get back on their ship, and these four men, one up there too, refuse to let them back on. Whether it's accurate historically or not, I don't think it's a mistake that Russell painted this right before we get to Fiji. So during the days of whaling, Fiji was known as Cannibal Island. Cannibalism did happen there, um, and in fact, one of the things we have in the whaling museum from Fiji is a cannibal fork. Those forks would have been used to eat the brains of those who were cannibalized. Uh, another reason Fiji had a bad reputation also has to do with colonialism and the way the Pacific was carved up. So the Pacific was carved up into three regions. Polynesia, which just means many islands, so Hawaii was a part of Polynesia, the Marquesas were a part of Polynesia. Micronesia, which means tiny islands, and then Melanesia, which means black islands. So Melanesian islands are those islands with people who are darker skinned. Back then, even into the early 20th century, Melanesians were always associated with Africans rather than other Pacific Islanders, and therefore were seen as less friendly, more savage, more heathen, all of that. Of course, within the Pacific, they did not have those same boundaries, so people were trading and interacting among themselves without any notion of, we're different based on skin color or hair type. But because Fiji was Melanesian and because it was very warlike um, and cannibalism did take place, it had a very bad reputation. So were the Fijians genetically similar to Africans or more genetically similar to no. New Zealanders? Yes, Australian, exactly. So this last scene, uh, I always like being able to stop here because this was actually presented to me on my first day working at the Whaling Museum. So the, the maritime historian Michael Dyer called me into his office and said, I don't know what this is a picture of. You're an anthropologist. What's going on here? And I looked at it briefly and I said, I think it's a childbirth scene. Um, knowing what I know about how childbirth is handled throughout much of Melanesia, much of the Pacific, in fact, um, this is probably a childbirth scene. They're in a secluded place. There are only two women there. She looks like she's in a position of giving birth. Um, on islands like Fiji, childbirth was seen as such a spiritually powerful thing that you wouldn't want to be around it. Um, now, any woman who's given birth knows it might be kind of tough to do on your own. So often a mother or sister or some other female relative would accompany you. But that woman who was accompanying you as a midwife, it was very dangerous for her to be in the presence of childbirth. And so this is why I think the women are behind this sort of mountain or hill, secluded, um, so that the woman laying backwards can give birth. Another really important thing about this scene in the painting are these clay pots. Fiji is the only place in the Pacific where cooking was traditionally done in clay pots. 
And it was such an important part of their culture that only a particular caste in Fiji was allowed to make pots out of clay, and only women in that caste were allowed to do it. And so somehow, uh, Russell was able to capture something that most Fijians wouldn't be able to see. And he knew the importance of these clay pots, or maybe he just happened to stumble upon this, who knows. But I'd like to think he somehow found out about the importance two things in Fijian culture and, sh and chose to use them to represent them. Now, of course, this is where Roll 4 ends. This is not where a whaling voyage would end. And in fact, there is a fifth roll. We have no idea where it is. It's been missing for about 100 years. Um, so it was missing before we ever got the rest of the panorama. But the rest of it would have taken you on the rest of a whaling voyage, which would have gone from here to New Zealand, to St. Helena, and then back to New Bedford. And of course, the hope would be that when you came back to New Bedford, your whaling oil barrels would be full, and everyone would get their play, and the owners would be able to uh, capitalize on sending men out to sea for four months. Uh, unfortunately, you can't see how Russell depicted that. But our hope is that someone's going to see all of the publicity about the panorama and figure out, oh, that's what's in my dad's attic. <laughs> but, you know, just to make clear, this is not where a whaling voyage would have ended. It would have ended around South Africa and then the return to New So do you have any questions for me? curious about the uh, um, environmental conditions here because you said it got set up before the AC was working. Mm -hmm. Are there any constraints like a humidifier or dehumidifier as the case may be? Anything like yeah. that for preservation's sake? So it might not feel like it, but we do have those little, it almost looks like a thermostat, but it's a little machine that checks the humidity to make sure it doesn't go over a certain number. I think we have it set at 70 or something like that. So. It doesn't feel like it, but this is a climate controlled area okay. for the painting. And of course, you know, after it's done being exhibited here, one of the things we'd like to do with this painting is have it be a traveling exhibit. But one, we have to find places that have the space to set this up, even if it's in a different configuration, but we would need the space. Um, and also climate control is an issue. Now, has it been digitized in some way? Like, oh loads, yes. Loads of photography has this. Yeah, so we had uh, a table built that you could put one of the rolls on and we would roll it out, take a picture, roll it out, take a picture. That was made into one long continuous digital file. And so in the museum, if you go in the room where the Lagoda is, right. if you've ever South been to the end. museum, um, we've got two columns set up like that and the panorama scrolls digitally. Now, it's nothing compared to what you just saw here, but it's actually the way the panorama was intended to be seen. So this would have been shown in a humongous building called the Cyclorama, and it would have moved through that building. So before the days of movies, this, is, this was a movie. And Russell did it that way so that he could use this painting to earn income. We will never show it that way again because it would destroy the painting. Um, but you do get a sense of what it would have been like to see it in that digital version. How many years was it displayed? How many years was, was it, it displayed? That's a tough question. So it was displayed by Russell for a couple of years. And it okay. went to, it did really well on the East Coast. Not so well when they shipped it out to places like Chicago. I think people there just had no sense of sea life, you know, and, and didn't care. Um, so it didn't do so well there. Popped up again 
in the early 20th century. It was shown a couple of times. It was in the 1964 World's Fair in New York. New Bedford gave a lot of stuff to that World's Fair, so this was displayed along with those things. Um, and then later on, it was displayed in a New Bedford Almax, or something like that, uh, in an old supermarket building. So okay. it's it hasn't been displayed too long at any one point, but it's been displayed since it was painted every few decades. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So is this the beginning on this side? Yeah, this is the beginning right I'm just going to walk around through it once. Yeah, we have